Good Lord, ride all the way. A ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Hello, and welcome to SLU, where there really is space for everyone. I'm Paul Cox, and tonight we're exploring the full Hunter's Moon live through SLU's telescopes. Now, this view, wait for it on the horizon. There's the shadow of the Pico del Tedi. Tell you about that in a second. But this is from earlier on this evening. There's the bright orb of the Hunter's Moon rising above the horizon. How cool is that? And then we're going to see, I think, in just a second, uh, there will be a reflection on the ocean from that moon as it rises up. Now, that is at, uh, oh, look at that beautiful image. That, that camera is at 10,000 feet altitude uh, on the island of Tenerife. That's 300 miles off the west coast of Africa. And on that little ridge just down there to the right, on the ridge of the mountain, on uh, the ridge of the volcano, is SLU's observatory at the uh, Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. And that's where the telescopes are based, where we're going to be watching this marvellous, marvellous hunter's moon tonight. Now, we've partnered with our friends at the Old Farmer's Almanac uh, to bring you an absolutely packed show to learn more about this particular full moon. And if we think about what a full moon actually is, um, if you can imagine, if you can imagine my head all right, is the Earth, the moon, the full moon is behind me, but directly in front of me where you are, you're the sun. So from my face is being illuminated by the sun, so I'm in daylight and all we can see is the sun. But on the opposite side of the Earth, on the back of my head, is uh, the UK and they can see the full moon behind me being totally illuminated. So it's just the sun earth and moon being in a roughly straight line so uh, there you can see the phases of it there now anyway what have we got coming up in tonight's show it's a really really interesting one uh we are going to be welcoming two very special guests tonight and first of all i'll be joined by janice stillman uh, regular viewers will know that janice is the editor of the old farmers almanac and she's going to help her enlighten us as to why this particular full moon is called the Hunter's Moon. It's kind of clues in the name on this one, isn't it, really? Uh, but then we're going to welcome a favourite guest of SLU members, and that's, of course, Bob Berman. Uh, we're going to be discussing with him lunar impacts. Did you know the moon is under constant bombardment by meteoroids and asteroids? Uh, we'll also uh, find out just how often and whether or not we should be uh, concerned by that. We're also going to be talking about... Uh, the effects um, of a full moon on human beings. Uh, Bob's got some uh, fascinating little stories to tell us on that one, and you might be a bit surprised by some of them. But uh, let's take a very quick look at our live feeds tonight. Now then, that is the panorama from the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. And although it kind of looks like blue skies, doesn't it? Well, it is blue skies. And it looks like the sun's in the sky, but it's not. That is the full moon illuminating the entire mountain. It's why so many astronomers curse a full moon, because it's very, very difficult uh, to image dim objects, faint galaxies and nebulae and things like that through SLU's telescopes or any other telescopes. Now, this is, um, which one is this? This is the Pico del Tedi cam. So this is the same one that we, we saw that video from at the beginning of the show. And you can see we've got some pretty heavy clouds over the island tonight, but um, we have still got some images. I dared to open up the dome, and there we see, uh, that's our all sky camera. This is a special camera that SLU members usually use uh, to monitor the skies over the observatory. And you can see there the bright moon, you can see that enormous ring as well that's caused by the, the optics, and you can actually see that in the sky as well kind of gives rainbow colours. Now you can see there it is clearing. So let's take a quick look at our wide, yes, there you go. There's our wide field telescope. This is SLU's smallest telescope, but it has the largest field of view, which makes it absolutely ideal for the moon because we can get to see the full disc. Now, if we, I opened up the dome 
actually we, we've been closed because of these clouds, but I opened it up just for the show because it's really surprising at how much cloud you can actually image the moon through. And uh, it was even worse earlier on and we were still getting some images. So we'll keep an eye on that image tonight. If it starts going a bit dark or a bit, bit shady, then we know that more cloud uh, has come over. Now, uh, don't forget, uh, SLU members, if you're watching on the live channel, the event page at slu.com, you can use the Starshare camera to uh, snap any of those images live. So that'll be cool. Now, what else have we got coming up? We're going to take a very quick commercial break now, but when we return, I'm going to be joined by our first guest, Janice Stillman editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, and she's going to talk about why this particular full moon became known as the Hunter's Moon. And then a little later, I'll be discussing lunar impacts with Bob Berman, a slew astronomer and astronomy editor for the Old Farmer's Almanac. Uh, we'll also explain, actually, uh, why we're not calling this month's full moon a supermoon like so many others. We'll explain that one to you as well. And if you have questions for me, all my esteemed guests tonight, uh, you can send them to at SLU on Twitter, or you can use the live chat uh, next to the video on the live channel page at SLU.com. Don't go away, we'll be right back with Janice Stillman after this short commercial break. And welcome back to the show. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome the uh, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Janice Stillman, to our show tonight. Janice, thank you so much for joining us and welcome back to SLU for tonight. Hi, Paul. It's great to be with you this month, as always. Thank you very much. Uh, now, for viewers who don't know about the Old Farmer's Almanac, what is it and, and what does it include? Well, the Old Farmer's Almanac is first and foremost a calendar of the heavens. That is, it displays the, the rhythm and glory of nature in all of its predictions for all the astronomical events throughout the year. And that includes sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, moon phases, all the conjunctions, all the planets and stars that can be seen, and what's more, advice on where to look in the sky. And from that astronomical calendar flows all the rest of the content in the publication. For example, the, the weather defines the seasons, and so you'll find forecasts for weather predictions in the Old Farmer's Almanac. You've also got the gardening seasons and all the attendant tasks and chores throughout the various seasons, planting in the summer and the spring and, and harvesting and preparing for the next season in the fall. So you've got advice on that. You'll find outdoor information such as the best fishing days, which also hinge on the uh, full moons. You've got anniversary stories because the almanac is a time capsule of the year, home remedies because folks to, like to learn about natural sort of pantry potions, we call them, profiles of animals, profiles of anniversary events, trends, because again, it's a little prediction of what we can expect in the year to come. Remarkably accurate, if I may say so myself, from <laughs> trends in farming and food and fashion and collectibles and things like that. So it's really a, a time capsule of the year a calendar of the heavens, and the one book you can read all year long because there is something indeed for every single day of the year from trivia and ha holiday uh, information and astronomical data. And you know, what's especially fun, I think, for folks to look at this time of year too, is the sunrise and sunset times, yes, in your area, yes. but also the length of day. Because here we are in autumn, and we're seeing the days get shorter, the sun sets earlier, the sun comes up later in the morning, and you wonder just how much, how many real daylight minutes do we have? And I notice that, for example, between this full moon and next full moon, we will lose about an hour of daylight time. Wow! It might be so it's a really bit of rapidly here, depending disappear. on where you are, but it's kind of remarkable to to think of that, and you can see that specifically delineated in the Old Farmers Almanac or on our website almanac.com if you put in your zip code. 
Okay, so make the most of those daylight hours because it's rapidly diminishing. But we are here, as you said, to talk about uh, the moon. And this month's uh, full moon is called the full hunter's moon. So how did, I, I think we've got, I kind of got a clue on this one, Janice, but how did it get its name? Well, you know, certainly the Native Americans and early peoples named the moons by virtue of the observations that they made in the course of time. So, for example, the full hunter moon this time of the year was the light that enabled them to prepare for the winter, to hunt down animals, to get the meat and skins and furs that they would need for the upcoming winter season. So it provided the light for them to do that. So I, I guess it's, you know, it's after that the Native Americans were certainly at one with, with nature. So this is after the period when, you know, small animals have been reproducing and their young are growing. Uh, and now they've got to start thinking about number one and storing meat and furs for the winter. And as you've just said, you know, they will have noticed that daylight was rapidly diminishing as well. So, you know, the urgency was really there. The ebb and flow of, of time and the seasons was really giving them a very big signal. Yes, and they had other names that also described the events of the season and so again, cued them into what to expect. For example, some tribes called this the falling leaves moon. Others called it the moon when the birds fly south because of course we still see the birds flying south these days to escape the cold climate and the northern part of the uh, continent. And it's the moon when water begins to freeze on the edge of the streams. And certainly these days when we're hearing about frost, hard frost, a light frost, that too is when water starts to freeze. So all of these were a way for them to mark and count and measure the seasons as we go forward and pre prepare for what was to come. Now, you know, I've, I've just traveled back from uh, SLU's headquarters in Connecticut on the east coast of America. And one thing that surprised me there versus the UK is just how rapidly autumn fall came. You know, one day it seemed like a beautiful summer's day and within two weeks, you know, all of the trees had lost a, a vast number of leaves and it had really, you know, there was that chill, that autumnal chill uh, in the air. But, and, and that's probably associated actually with, um, I've heard of one bit of weather law, which is associated with this October full moon. It, it's something to do with the frost, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, in weather law, we note the full moon in October without frost, no frost till the full moon in November. So if we can escape this weekend without frost, we have a good chance of relatively mild conditions until next month this time. Okay. It's a tough call and it may not be absolute everywhere. So there may be frost in some places and not elsewhere. So just wait and see what happens. Well, I know here in the UK, we've had uh, some, some forecasts of the first frost uh, for this weekend. So uh, let's cross fingers that uh, it holds off so that we can uh, wait until the full moon of November. Uh, Janice, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then you and I are going to uh, talk about some of the other history and folklore surrounding the uh, October full moon, including uh, that uh, from ancient Rome, I understand. Exactly right. Thank you. Now, uh, to the thousands of people tuning into the show right now from around the globe, I've been told actually it's tens of thousands tonight, so... Uh, do tweet us to at SLU. Where are you watching us from? Uh, let us know. Uh, I want to take a moment anyway to really encourage you to join the expedition to explore the universe with us. We do this every single night at SLU. Our members aren't passengers either, but they, uh, they kind of sign on as working crew to take control of our robotic telescopes, both uh, in the Canary Islands and in Chile for those southern hemisphere skies. And they share the most interesting places in space with everyone else in the SLU community. Uh, we really say that SLU is social exploration uh, and together we've already visited over 50,000 different places in the sky and captured over 5 million photos, would you believe? And you know, working as a team as well in that community makes it easy to learn from each other and share our diverse perspectives. And those are fueled in equal part by science, and imagination and the human spirit to just search and wonder together. Uh, who knows, we may be alone in the universe, but you'll never be alone at SLU. Uh, now, I also want to share a little secret with you. It kind of is out of the bag, but a year in the making. 
there is a new SLU coming. That's right, smarter, more powerful, and easier than ever to use. Uh, we're really, really excited to uh, show you that when it's ready. I've already taken that out to a few SLU members who are helping us with some content. So you really are welcome aboard SLU's expedition into outer space. It's free to try, so do join our adventure into the great unknown. Now, don't go anywhere because we'll be right back after this short commercial break with Janice Stillman. And welcome back to SLU and our broadcast of the Full Hunter's Moon. Uh, I'm Paul Cox and I'm here with uh, Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Janice, welcome back to the show. Great to be with you again, Paul. Thank you. Now, earlier we were discussing some of the ways the October full moon has been viewed by native cultures in the United States. But of course, the US isn't the only place where the full moon has been celebrated historically. And I believe you dug up some interesting facts about the month of October, um, some of which kind of circle back to the moon. For example, the, the Romans tried to change the name of the month, didn't they? Well, people are always fascinated to know where the names of the days and the months come from. Mm. And you can find this in the Almanac and on Almanac.com. But since we're sitting here in October, Let's just discuss the idea that in ancient Rome, in their calendar, October was the name of the eighth month of the year, Octo for eight. It comes from the Latin word for eight, O-C-T-O. When the Romans converted to a 12-month calendar, they tried to rename the month after a number of Roman emperors, but the name October stuck, and that's what we've got these days. So it's an ancient name, but something we're so familiar with, we sometimes don't even think about it. Well, isn't it wonderful? That's a great demonstration, isn't it, of, you know, common usage and common usage being so difficult to shake. I mean, it must drive some people up the wall, you know, English scholars in, uh, in uh, Oxford and Cambridge and the, the dictionary. They must be pulling their hair out. But uh, actually, um, that, that brings us on quite nicely. This month also has an interesting name in Old English, doesn't it? Yes, indeed. In Old England, the month was called Winmanath, or perhaps Winemanath, I don't want to mispronounce that, but there, it's not clear exactly in the Old English. Perhaps you can actually shed some light on that. But that <laughs> means wine month, and you can understand that because it was the time when wine was made. You can imagine the grapes have been harvested, and yeah. so they've been pressed, and the wine was made and put into um, vats. The English also called it whiter phyllus. Winter phyleth, whiter phyleth is the pronunciation for the winter full moon. That's what it means. They considered this full moon to be the start of winter. And again, when you think of the frost setting in, the days becoming shorter, you can understand that this full moon would be the start of the cold period in uh, Old England. So it, it's fascinating to step back and take a look at, again, the names of the moons, the names of the months, the names of the days. And that's just part of the lore and fun, really, of the old farmer's almanac. Well, it's, it's all part of this. I, I'm absolutely fascinated with all of this. You know, it's how mankind down the ages have, have marked the ebb and flow and the astronomical events, such as these full moons, and even where the moon and sun sets, obviously, and rises on the horizon, to mark that ebb and flow and the important um, the important tasks that they need to be doing each month. And I can't think of a more important one than a wine full moon. I, what did you call that one again? I think that's a great one. Wymanath. It's W-I-N-M-O-N-A-T-H. So Wynmanath okay. or Wymanath, I'm, I'm not completely clear. But yes, it is the, uh, it's a fun name, been a reference to making wine. But, you know, the moon was always so important in so many cultures because the full moon indicated when to do so many chores, from pruning and planting to cleaning up the garden to fishing to hunting, as we pointed out, and to just prepare in general. 
And that's just this month. Every month had, a, had numerous names and numerous tasks were assigned. And that's wonderful when you think of how the astronomy that surrounds us all brings us all together and puts us all yeah. into the glorious rhythm of nature. It is. I, and on that note, Janice, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this October full hunter's moon. Uh, we're going to see you again next month for the mega beaver moon. That's going to be a great one. That's the largest moon of the year. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you, Janice. Uh, that was Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now, speaking of the mega moon, uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. But when we come back, I'll be uh, talking to SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac about the uh, many fascinating features that we can observe on the moon through SLU's telescopes. And we'll also be talking about that upcoming mega moon. Uh, we'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to our live show of the full Hunter's Moon here at SLU, where there really is space for everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Cox, and tonight uh, we've been talking about the way different cultures have looked at this particular full moon and even marked uh, the seasons by it and the ebb and flow of time. But did you know that the moon is constantly changing? Yes, it's being constantly bombarded by asteroids uh, in kind of a cosmic shooting gallery. And here to talk uh, more about this subject is SLU astronomer and astronomy editor for the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Paul. Good to be here as always. Well, I was reading some fascinating figures, uh, I think last week, Bob, about just how much the moon is bombarded by material. I mean, it's a huge quantity, isn't it? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, the Moon and Earth uh, received not terribly disparate amounts. We have more of a gravity to pull it in, but we have an atmosphere that burns it up more easily. Yeah. The Moon has no protection. Wham! Everything that hits the Moon's surface, it remains there. And we, anybody with even the smallest telescope uh, can see that. The slew telescopes are overkill in that department. Any mm -hmm. inexpensive department store telescope shows the violence on the Moon, especially the violence that happened uh, in the Wild West years of the solar system, longer ago than oh. about three and a half billion years ago, when there were things marauding, objects just marauding through the solar system, and all the planets and all the moons of the solar system really got pounded much more frequently then than now. And most of the uh, violent evidence is on the moon. The craters and the rough features mm -hmm. come from that period. And it's got that one of my favorite astronomy terms, the, the late heavy bombardment. And, and what we're looking at here are some, some maps actually of uh, some work that's been done by NASA and a whole group of amateur astronomers actually who have been getting involved and monitoring the moon all the time. Um, and you saw a map a, a second ago of all of the actual impacts that have been spotted. And this one uh, was taken um, by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance uh, spacecraft. And this is of the same area. And, and this is a fascinating before and after image, Bob. You know, they, they went over once and they're mapping the moon at this very high resolution, went over it again a couple of years later, and suddenly they see this new impact crater and this, you know, huge spread of e ejecta. Now, you've spoken before on some of our shows about asteroids, that some of these objects, they don't have to be very big to actually cause some fairly large craters. And, and that has to do with, with what? Their velocity, their speed? Yes, exactly right, Paul. The uh, actual kinetic energy, the impact force, the explosiveness, if you like, of an impact has to do with its uh, uh, mass, 
times its uh, velocity squared. So a little change in velocity. You get a second object that hits the moon just a little faster than the first. And it doesn't create just a little uh, difference. It, it creates a disproportionately large amount of damage. Wow. Uh, and you, you hinted at it earlier uh, that the, they have actually, I, I, I believe, kind of mapped this, these impacts on the moon. And we also can uh, detect uh, the, the meteoroids that are hitting Earth's atmosphere. And it does. The calculations kind of come up that we're being impacted roughly, uh, roughly the same rate for our given sizes. But you also hinted that very few of these objects actually reach the Earth's surface. Um, so is that the only reason why we don't see the number of craters on the Earth as we do on the Moon? Well, that's the main reason, is that the atmosphere burns them up. Every time we see a meteor in the sky, that is a, a, a world's in collision. That, that is an example of something colliding with us, but burning up as it's trying to reach our surface. And that's why very few, proportionately, of the uh, meteoroids that come in from uh, outer space, let's, let's call it, and mm. go through the atmosphere, actually safely make it entirely through the atmosphere and can be picked up. Not that a lot of them are. It's right. uncommon. In the state in which I live, I live in the mountains here in upstate New York, and only 13 meteorites have been found in the entire history of the state, wow. which shows uh, wow. how tough it is for an object to make it all the way through. To make it through. And uh, well, the other thing I was thinking about, actually, Bob, um, before we go to a break, was I want, we've got the Orionid meteor shower coming up. I wonder what a meteor shower would look like on the moon. They're obviously not going to be burning up because there's no atmosphere. But I did wonder whether or not you kind of see these kind of little plumes of dust, you know, as these tiny, tiny specks that normally burn up in our atmosphere kind of hit the regolith, the dust uh, of the moon. What do you, what do you, what's your best guess on that one? Yeah, that's a good point, and uh, probably in a very intense one, such as the Leonids that we had back on November 18th of 2001, then so many are coming in, uh, in that case it was five every minute surrounding any observer. Like if you were outside watching then you would have seen five a minute. And so yes, there would have been five impacts around you every minute, and uh, perhaps you would have seen the, the dust and debris being hurled up, even though there's no atmosphere to create a, a glowing streak in the sky the way it is here. Would be an interesting one. Anyway, uh, Bob, you're going to join me again a little bit later to tell viewers about uh, the mega moon next, next month. Um, and we'll also chat about whether the moon, the full moon, impacts people's lives. Does it affect mental health or increase crime rates or even birth rates about full moon? So we'll see you back a little bit later, Bob. Okay, good. And we're looking at this live all sky image. So this special low light camera it looks like daylight, doesn't it? It's a blue sky. No, that's the full hunter's moon there in the sky. And it looks, this special camera looks 180 degrees from one horizon to the other. On the left hand side, if you turn your head sideways, you can kind of see that those are the slew domes. We've only got one dome open this evening, uh, dome two. Uh, and that houses the wide field telescope, slew's smallest telescope, with one of the largest fields of view. So it's ideal to see the entire moon. We've kept the, the other domes closed because you can see here, we're suffering from quite a lot of cloud, but this is a live image. Uh, there you can see it, uh, the dinosaur moon. Can you see that uh, T-Rex uh, heading a football? We might show you the uh, diagram of that later, but there's a live view uh, from the wide field telescope. Don't forget, members, you can be snapping any of these images uh, using the Starshare camera if you're watching at slew.com. Uh, now, what we've got coming up uh, next is we're going to take a very quick commercial break, but I did want to tell you about a special broadcast we've got coming up uh, next week. Thursday, October 20th, we are kicking back to kind of watch uh, the Orionid meteor shower live. You can join us for a night of stargazing and meteor watching uh, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's 1 a.m. Uh, for Western Europe and the UK. Uh, we are going to discover how this meteor shower was caused by the famous 
Halley's Comet, uh, and we'll learn how you can photograph meteors from your own backyard. Uh, and also, actually, a fascinating, fascinating subject here. Did you know you can hear meteors as well as see them? Well, we're actually going to be uh, letting you listen to meteors, and we'll explain that as well uh, on Thursday night. And if you've got a clear sky yourself, then take us outside with you and use us as your soundtrack. Uh, for your meteor watching adventure. Now we are going to be right back looking at this lovely live image of the full hunter's moon. We're going to be right back after this short commercial break. Welcome back to SLU's Full Hunter's Moon Show. Uh, I'm here with SLU astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman. Hi, welcome back, Bob. Thank you, Paul. Good to be now, here. Now, Bob, we're not, we're not going to spend much on this next subject, uh, but we are going to talk um, just in a second about the effects of these full moons on humans, which is a, a absolutely intriguing subject in its own right. But we have had some questions saying, People have seen um, other reports that this full moon is a supermoon, but we've chosen specifically not to call this one a, a supermoon. I don't know if you want to uh, explain why we're, why we're choosing to use next month's uh, full moon as our supermoon or megamoon rather than tonight's one. Yeah, Paul, uh, on the one hand, we don't want to be bah humbug. We don't want to be Scrooge yeah. McDuck and uh, shoot down <laughs> The fun of having supermoons all over the place. Uh, traditionally, supermoon is the closest full moon of that month, or sometimes the closest full moon of the year. Mm. So there's no mm. precise definition, and uh, the difference between the largest possible full moon and the smallest. This is what we're showing you right now. Difference of about 16 percent. Uh, you could see that yourself if you held out an aspirin. I never said this before because I just figured it out this week, Paul. Okay. If you held out an aspirin at arm's length against the ceiling, then ask yourself, is that aspirin look larger or smaller than the largest moon I've ever seen? Almost everybody would say, well, it looks very small. That aspirin at arm's length is much yeah. smaller than the moon appears. But that's wrong. The moon appears quite a bit larger, even the largest supermoon, than an aspirin at arm's length. So... Uh, it's hard to see the difference. So you mm -hmm. and I have been a little conservative with what we call a supermoon, the largest moon of the year. And we're going to have that next, uh, next month. And yeah. the reason that that's particularly important is because that's going to be the closest moon in 38 years. I the know, it's amazing, supermoon. isn't it? So, boy, that's hard to compete with. You know, that's going to happen on November 14th. Yeah. And how can you compete with that? So the one that's yeah. uh, happening tonight well, it's true, this is the fourth closest moon of 2016 of this year. It, it, it counts, it's certainly the closest moon tonight of this month of October. Mm. So you could call it a supermoon, but yeah. compared to the next one, it's going to pale. So it's all a matter of, um, of definition, yeah. It is, and this is an overlay actually that I did from our half meter telescope, which is really the best telescope to image very faint objects like galaxies and nebulae, but uh, here we used it through special filters. Uh, the pink color is artificial. I just wanted to, to show the difference between what we call a mini moon, an apogee moon, and a mega moon, a perigee moon. And you know, we were talking about it uh, with some of the SLU team earlier on actually, Bob, and we were thinking, you know, Last year, I think NASA had written down that there were three supermoons in a row, and then this year, you know, two months in a row, this one and next month. We were having difficulty kind of trying to think of any other phenomena where you'd celebrate several of their occurrences, and they're not special. So, you know, this is why we do want our interpretation of a supermoon is the I th largest I think you're so full right, moon Paul. of the I year. Think, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. For example, this month's National Geographic magazine, a very respectable magazine, says that if you go out, you'll see something spectacular. The supermoon <laughs> moon tonight is spectacular. 
But honestly speaking, anyone who goes out, try it. You know, check it out. Look at yeah. the sky. And uh, you tell us whether it jumps out at you as a moon that looks particularly large. It really won't, yeah. except when it's rising. And that's the famous moon illusion. The moon always looks enormous when it's near the horizon, either rising or setting. But uh, other than that, uh, no. So, so we want to be a little cautious about what we yeah. call spectacular, lest people get soured on astronomy. And when we talk about Absolutely. truly spectacular Absolutely. things like the total exactly. solar eclipse next year on August 21st, people uh, don't believe us. Yeah. Now, Bob, here we go. We've got, you can see here, we've got some clouds tonight. Uh, so this is a live image coming in uh, from the wide field telescope there. And you can see the clouds kind of going over the top of it. Now, we were talking before as we look at this you know, full hunter's moon. We've kind of heard, had a, we've been hearing for decades, uh, you know, hundreds of years actually, that full moons affect humans. And we're not talking about you know, silly things like werewolves, but we hear stories of full moons affecting mental health, increasing crime rates, and even an increase in birth rates around full moons. But is there really any evidence to support any of this, or kind of are they old wives' tales? They really are wives' tales. There has been a number of studies looking for each of those things, a study looking for mental health admissions to mental hospitals, crisis centers, calls to crisis centers uh, at the full moon versus other times of the month showed no increase around the time of the full moon, which honestly is a little surprising because you'd think there'd be a psychogenic effect. In other words, huh? since we all have heard that the full moon is associated with lunacy, think of the word, lunacy, yeah. uh, comes, from, comes from the moon, uh, people might expect it to happen and just from the expectations, they might feel psychologically stressed at that time. Because if you believe something, you know how important the mind is uh, in, yeah. in actually producing an effect. However, as I said, actual calls to crisis centers don't go up at the time of the full moon. Another study that looked uh, for crime rates, they used Dade County, that is Miami, Florida, and found that crime does increase uh, with warmer weather and on weekends. Mm -hmm. But there is no increase as per the uh, phase of the moon. And finally, oh, okay. a major study looking at births, Meninger and Meninger, a father and son team uh, back in the late 1950s, did find an increase not on the night of the full moon, but on the uh, period around the full moon. And so that made people think along those lines for a while that births had such an increase. But now it's been explained away as simply a psychogenic effect. In other right. words, people in the, emerge, in the maternity ward have heard the rumor that uh, births increase, and therefore they'll say things like, oh, here we go again, it's the full moon tonight, we're in yeah. for it, and so they'll see what they're expecting. So we have to yeah. be very careful with these. Yeah, I'll make those connections. I know that there was a, a, a study, a similar study on crime rates here in the UK uh, a couple of decades ago. Now, this hasn't been repeated in any follow-up study, but they actually uh, noted that there was a reduction in crime. And what they put it down to was under moonlight, it's easier to see a thief, a burglar. Um, so they you know, it's like being in a torture underneath the security camera, isn't it? But there have been other studies as well um, with security cameras, and obviously amateur astronomers are all about uh, dark skies and things, that actually security cameras are beneficial to robbers because they, they cause such huge contrasts and shadows which people can then hide in. So, uh, you know, the jury is still out on all of that, Bob. Now, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are going to see you back um, on Thursday's show. I know you've got a couple of segments for us with the Orionid meteor shower. That's, uh, now, how do you say it? Uh, we tend to say Halley's Comet here, but I believe you use Halley's Comet. Is that right? Yes, uh, I think most people say uh, Halley's, but popularly it's called Halley's because of mm. the, the uh, rock group Bill Haley and the Comets, yeah. who made yeah. Rock Around the Clock. So I think it'll be forever be called uh, Bill Haley, unfortunately. <laughs> Haley. Oh, dear. And I really don't like that music either, so that's kind of spoiled Halley's Comet for me now. So anyway, Bob, we'll see you again on uh, Thursday, and uh, we'll also see you again for next month's Real Supermoon. Thank you, Paul.
That was Bob Berman, a slew astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. Now let's take a look at our live streams again. Uh, we'll take a look at the All Sky camera to see whether or not sky conditions have improved. No, still some pretty crummy clouds. So I think after the show, we'll have to uh, close up again because we'll never image galaxies or nebulae or anything else. Don't forget, these are the telescopes of the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canary Islands, 300 miles off the west coast of Africa, 8,000 feet altitude. And those are the telescopes that SLU members control every night. It is really easy to do so. If you have got you know, any kind of interest, well, if you're here, I'll tell you, you'd enjoy using the telescopes. There we've got our live panorama. You can see in the bottom right one, that's Pico del Tedi, the actual volcanic cone. And uh, in fact, I don't know if you've been reading the news, but uh, some new volcanic activity has been uh, recorded over the last couple of weeks. So we're keeping a close eye on that. Uh, but uh, we are still getting these glorious live images coming through from our wide field telescope. This is our smallest telescope, but has the largest field of view so it can see the largest area of the sky. And there you can see the glorious full hunter's moon um, to end our show off. Now, that just about wraps it up for us here at SLU. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful guest tonight. We had uh, Janice Stillman, editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac. And I tell you, if you haven't picked up a copy of the Old Farmer's Almanac, you need to do it now. Pick up the 2017 uh, copy now. Uh, if you're interested in anything to do with space or any any outdoorsy kind of stuff, or you just like to feel the ebb and flow of nature and the seasons, then pick up a copy of the Old Farmer's Almanac. It's great for gardeners as well, of course. Uh, she, now, she helped us understand why this October's full moon was known as the Hunter's Moon and still is. And of course, slow astronomer and astronomy editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac, Bob Berman, he helped us understand how the moon uh, hasn't really been shown to affect our biology in the way that many people have suspected over hundreds of years. So look up at it tonight, because I think it does affect us, because frankly, I look up at a full moon and I'm just in awe. If you stare at it for any period of time, really just think about what it is. Don't see that familiar object that you're used to seeing. Look at it and think of it as this perfect sphere orbiting our planet. It's a miraculous place, but we almost get moon blind, don't we? Uh, but anyway, uh, what else have we got? Well, coming up on Thursday, as I said, October 20th, we're sitting back in our garden chairs for a night of meteor watching for the Great Orionids Meteor Shower. Join us uh, from 8 p.m. Eastern time, that's 1 a.m. for the UK and Western Europe. Uh, we'll discover those links between this particular meteor shower and the famous Halley's Comet. Uh, we'll also explain how you can photograph meteors from your own garden or backyard. And it's a lot, lot simpler than you may think. And uh, of course, if you're interested in partnering up with SLU and actually giving us a live feed uh, from wherever you are, then uh, just email me at paul at slew.com. And we'll uh, even show you on that night how we can listen to meteors as well as see them whizzing across our skies. Well, we're going to leave you with this lovely, lovely image of the full hunter's moon tonight. I'm Paul Cox, and this has been another astronomical production from SLU. Uh, we'll see you again on Thursday, uh, if not sooner. Bye for now.